We're going to have a look now at what has actually happened this year in relation to Israel's position among the nations in the Middle East. And I'm known to exaggerate from time to time, but I, I don't exaggerate in saying in the title of this study, Amazing Political and economic realignments. And you'll see the reason that I'm not exaggerating as we proceed here <coughs> this afternoon. But firstly, an analysis of Ezekiel 38, particularly verses 1 to 13. What does it require? You know, when we read this chapter, and I guess, like us at home, while uh, there was a time when we used to have a, a lecture or a talk on Ezekiel 38 every couple of weeks, every two or three weeks, we don't hear as much at home now about this chapter. That may, that may be different here. But it doesn't get quite the same attention that it used to get. But it's very important to us, as you know. So the first couple of verses require that a, that a dictator dominates the Eurasian continent. Eurasian continent means Europe and Asia. And that the territory east and north of Israel will be under Gogian control. This is five and six, and that a dependent Europe will fall under Gog's political control. We read nowhere, brothers and sisters and young people, that Europe has to fall to military occupation by Gog or Russia. They will simply fall into their hands, and of course things are beginning to trend in that direction. That the West Bank will be part of Israel uh, proper at the time of Armageddon. That's the requirement of verse 8, as we shall see in a minute. That Israel will be at peace internally and with her near neighbours. That's the message of verses 8 to 11 that we've just read. That Israel will be very prosperous and envied. That's the clear message of verse 12. And that Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will be the first ones to object to the Gogian invasion. Now we've been wont to say in the past that it will be Britain and the young lions that will be the first to object. That's not what Ezekiel 38 13 says, does it? It says Sheba and Dedan and then the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions. So you see Sheba and Dedan are the first cabs off the rank to object to the Gogian invasion. And you're going to see that's exactly what happened, or what is happening, in 2017. Against all the odds, a bit like the election of Donald Trump, a bit like Brexit, against all the odds, people think it's a fantasy, but we knew it had to happen, because the Bible said it would happen. And we're going to see that as we proceed in this session. And that Britain and the young lions would follow suit, so that when, when Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states object, Britain and the Young Lions, of which of course Canada is one, uh, will object as well. <clears throat> so that's what Ezekiel 38 requires. <coughs> and we're beginning to see some very real reasons why Donald Trump, Trump was elected against the odds. Because of course, just like Brexit, where God intervened with mighty storms that kept two million or more people away from voting, who would have voted yes because they were in and around the London area, so the no vote, 1 by 1.8 million or something like that. Uh, so God intervened to bring about the events of 2000, 23rd of June 2016. So he intervened, doubtless, in the events that brought about the election of Donald Trump. And nobody thought, one, that he was suitable for office or that he had any chance of winning that election. Huh? God knew otherwise. Well, we've seen some things happening from his office in recent times, haven't we? One of the recent ones, of course, is that he has declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and he intends to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem. The only problem, of course, he has, he was beaten to the gun. He was beaten by Vladimir Putin. That's not widely known, but you'll see a little bit later on that he was actually beaten by Putin. So the America First policy, and that's how he came to office, you know, on this policy of America First, is allowing Putin a relatively free hand in Eurasia and the Middle East. So that Trump's not really, really all that interested. His generals are, and you know, the, you know, the, the Pentagon is, but he's not all that interested in getting involved in the matters of other people. But he has a grand, he has a, a son-in-law. He has a son-in-law called. Jared Kushner. 
And his son-in-law is married to his favourite daughter, Ivanka, uh, one of the daughters of, of his first wife, Ivana. And this Jared Kushner just happens to be a Jew, a strict Jew. Okay? And he has now become one of the principal advisors, as indeed is his daughter, of Donald Trump. And Jared Kushner just happens to be a close friend of the now Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, 31 years of age. And amazing things have happened because of this friendship. Trump was there, of course, in Saudi Arabia during the year. He was there for a good reason, as you're going to see. This has brought about these new political alignments in the Middle East. Now, we don't know, but the North Korean crisis continues, of course, with the, what Donald Trump calls the little rocket man uh, threatening America. And uh, who knows what's going to happen there? I mean, the angels have got their, their hands on those strings and we don't know what we'll do. But one of the things that could happen is if Korea does get goaded into firing a, a rocket uh, that uh, lands in America somewhere, you can be assured that the stock market will take a heavy tumble. Uh, it may well be the beginnings of the Great Depression that the world knows is coming and which will be the time when you and I are removed for judgment. But we'll go into that tomorrow morning uh, in the exhortation, God willing. We'll be dealing with that particular aspect of the signs of the times tomorrow. So let's just drill down a bit into Ezekiel 38. You with me in Ezekiel 38, <coughs> verse 8? After many days, thou, Gog, he's talking to, shall be visited. Now that word visited in the Hebrew means, pekat, it means to oversee or to muster. Okay? So the angels are going to do this, and of course, God won't know this, but the angels will be manoeuvring events so that this happens. Now she'll come into the land that is brought back from the sword, is gathered out of many peoples, against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. So where are the mountains of Israel? Well, they're up the spine of the land, aren't they? This is the central massif of the land. The mountains of Israel, 90% of them are in the West Bank of today. 90%. So what that means, they start down there at Hebron, 3,300 feet or whatever that is, 1,000 metres in modern terms, uh, and they go right up to Gilboa up here. Okay, This is the mountains, 90% of them in the West Bank. What that's, t- what that's telling us is very plain, isn't it? It's telling us that the West Bank will be part of Israel proper at the time of Armageddon. And when Netanyahu was elected in, I think it was 2015 or 16, the very first thing he said when he gave his speech was Israel will ultimately annex the West Bank. That is Israel's intention. You know, we were there just a few weeks ago, whatever that was, October, for the Jerusalem Bible School, and we went up into the West Bank, went up to Samaria and other places in the West Bank. We got a, a Palestinian driver of a 15-seat bus, who was an idiot, but anyway, he said a number of things along the way that I found curious. For example, we would be going past a place and we'd say, well, there is, uh, you know, there's Ophra. We'd like to just stop here. Oh, no, no, no. Why not? That's Israeli. That happened four or five times. Can we stop here? Oh no. That's Israel. Really? I thought it was the West Bank. When you get to Shechem and you go into the old city of Shechem, they've got a big sign up there. It's brand spanking new. And it says at the top, the state of Palestine. Idiots. It's not the state of Palestine and it won't be. Because the scripture says... It will be part of Israel proper. When Go comes down into this land, they come down upon the mountains of Israel. Not the mountains of Palestine. Okay? So we know from Scripture that this will become part of Israel. If there is to be a Palestinian state, and I think there will be from the prophecies of Zephaniah 2 and Joel 3, it will be down here on the coastal plain, the land of the Philistine. Philistine, Palestine, that's where it comes from. That's where it will be, and I'll show you that that is a very clear prospect coming out of these new realignments 
in the Middle East that have happened this year. So I think Israel is going to take this area over as an end of plans. So when Donald Trump chose, and this is one of the first appointments that he made in January, when he named his prospective ambassador to Israel, he chose David N. Friedman, aligned with the Israeli far right, and of course a man who has very strong views, outspoken views, that stand in stark contrast to decades of American policy towards Israel. And one of those views is that Israel has a right to annex the West Bank. Okay? It would not be illegal, he says, for Israel to annex the West Bank. Why would Trump choose that man, do you think? <coughs> well, because Trump is going to agree to what Israel does when they annex the West Bank. So, again, we will see Bible prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. Now, I'm going to show you a series of slides based upon what I think probably is the best article that I've read this year on fulfilling Bible prophecy. The gentleman concerned is this fellow, Brian Schroger, who wrote this in July this year. He's a writer for the Jerusalem Journal, the principal writer. And this is what he wrote in part. Under the heading, Israel and the unexpected, notice the terminology, this is his heading, not mine. That's why it's in capitals. So it's straight off the, the headline, Israel and the unexpected new world order. So you get a bit of a gist as to where that's going. Well, let's read parts of this. In the new and surprising economic world order, Israel could gain a degree of wealth not seen since the days of King Solomon. That's not a bad way to start, is it? Over the past eight years, many unexpected diplomatic changes have occurred. The Islamic Republic of Iran has formed a partnership with the infidel nation of Russia. You know, Russia is Christian, nominally Christian. Less than two years ago, Russia moved into Syria and shows no signs of leaving. And Syria, despite its own problem with radical Islam, has strengthened bonds with Iran's fundamentalist regime that didn't get on very well with. So strange things are happening. Then he goes on to talk about BRICS, not the ones in the wall of the building. BRICS, this is the acronym for uh, Brazil, and you can see the colours. You probably can't see too much of the other nations in the grey. But here is Brazil over in South America. And then you've got Russia, which of course dominates the north. Then you've got India down here. Then you've got China. And of course a latecomer, it used to be BRIC, the latecomer is South Africa, who joined this BRICS movement. Now, why is this significant? Well, it's terribly significant. Because he points out that when they, when they formed this partnership in 2009, they had clear intentions. They have established their own international bank. They're in the process of developing their own internet-based coinage, like Bitcoin, okay, something like that. And they have developed a multi-trillion dollar plan called the Belt and Road Initiative. Now this is a land route based on the ancient Silk Road. You know, so we're going back to the times of Marco Polo. I mean, the ancient Silk Road. And they're going to build this massive highway and railway uh, uh, line uh, across, right across Asia, that red line that you can see going from China, right across here to the Syrian coast and into Turkey. They're going to build this in order to develop trade, obviously, between all these Asian countries and the Middle East and, and beyond into Europe. That's their plan. Well, of course, Israel knows this, and Israel wants to get in on the act. And we're going to see how they're getting on the act in a minute. But this article goes on this way. It says, the world's only Jewish state is making deals with Turkey, Russia and China, in spite of their alliances with Iran, which is dedicated to Israel's annihilation. So why, he asked the question, why is Jerusalem pursuing such deals? And ambivalent at best about Israel that these nations are, why are these nations agreeing to that? They're good questions. Most importantly, and this is where it starts to get interesting, most importantly, Israel is positioned to guard the world's internet. Everything today is traded, controlled, 
and administered online. What would happen if the internet went down? I mean, civilization would come to a grinding halt, wouldn't it? Yeah. And Israel is emerging as the world's number one guardian of the World Wide Web. And if it wasn't for Israel, in fact, some nations will admit, like Australia, they will admit that the internet would have come down, at least for a time, through hackers and other people uh, trying to do damage to it. Okay? So Israel has become very, very important to the nations of the world because of their cyber security. More about that in, in a minute. He goes on this way. The world depended on Israel for internet security. Now, I'm not going to read all of that because it, all it really says is that they're worried about China leading a, a, an economic, a global economic collapse. But what their answer is, is to get away from the US dollar and develop their own coinage, their own currency. See, they want to wipe the slate clean of nation-based currencies, especially the US dollar, and establish an international one like Bitcoin, perhaps. So if Bitcoin is the model for a new internet-based global currency, Israel is likely to be its guardian too, protecting that currency from hackers around the world. As chief of security for the world's information and currency and with energy independence, Israel stands to gain substantial wealth. So this fellow is making observations about what's been happening in 2017. He goes on to say this, it's a position that explains the willingness of, of Russia and China to negotiate with Israel today. It's also a position that invokes resentment tomorrow. Feeding that resentment will be the small matter of Iran's determination to annihilate the Jewish state. Right? He goes on talking about how you know, this, this unusual alliance between these nations who have not always been able to cooperate in the past is fragile. It's very fragile. For the sake of trade, China does not want this war for the same reason either does Russia and so on. But this is how he concludes. It says this. Maneuvering its way to the transport of goods via China's land and sea roads, this is this Belt and Road Initiative, Israel is floating the idea of an alternate shipping route to Egypt's costly Suez Canal. You know, it costs shipping companies and nations a lot of money to go through the That's the only revenue, basically the only revenue, that Egypt's got. It wasn't for the Suez Canal, they would have gone down the gurgler big time before this. So it will be cheaper and faster, says Israel, to deliver goods to Elat. So instead of going up the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal, it takes you ages to get through, why don't you just come up the Gulf of Aqaba next door, see the right-hand side of the Sinai Peninsula, and drop your goods at Elat, we have built, says Israel, a high-speed rail link between Elat and Ashdod. And we'll get these goods, these, these uh, containers delivered to Ashdod, and then you bring your ships up to Ashdod from somewhere else and cut them off, see? That's the policy. Now, you can imagine the frustration that this is going to bring, not just to Egypt, of course, but to other peoples. So that's where Israel is up to. They lead the world in agriculture and Arab climates, they're leading the world in technology and venture capital. Bear in mind that a lot of this technology is the result of the one and a half million Russians, Russian Jews, that came to Israel in the 1990s in the dreadful period of the Yeltsin years. The Brains Trust of Russia came. That's why Zechariah 14 says that Russia is going to take many into captivity. Why wouldn't you take back well, the Brains Trust that left you uh, in the 1990s, who ended up making Israel the leader in technology in the world. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, so I think this happened. The Ezekiel 38, verses 8 to 12, tell us one thing, don't they? They tell us that Israel is going to be extremely prosperous at the time of the Gobian invasion. They think an evil thought. They're going to go up to this land of wide open places. That what, that's what it means when it says unwalled villages, by the way. In Ezekiel 38, verse 11, that phrase, unwalled villages, is just the one Hebrew word, perazar, and it means simply open country. Literally, it should be rendered the, to the land of open spaces. Is it the land of open spaces today? Look, if you want to go from Jerusalem to Nazareth, you've actually got to go around the Green Lock. You know, you, you've got to go around the West Bank because it's, you know, it's the, the problem of Palestinians. 
Well, once Israel annexes, annexes the West Bank, it'll be a land of wide open spaces. There'll be no problem with this drive straight north up the massive of the land uh, into the Jezreel Valley. But this article goes on like this. It's been talking about this alliance and this, the treaties that are developing between nations that are quite diverse. If such a treaty failed, or if, any, or if for any reason Israel becomes an economic threat to BRICS, and that sounds a bit like Ezekiel 38 to me, that this land that's, uh, that's come out of many peoples, or gathered out of many nations, have gotten cattle and goods, and, well, because this is going to come on the back of the Great Depression. And it's clear that Israel will come out of that depression a lot quicker and a lot more prosperous than any other nation on the earth. So there's going to be envy. There's going to be a desire to take what they've got. Okay? It says, if Israel becomes an economic threat to bricks and one built, one road you know, by this new proposal to take freight from Elat to Ashdod, it is feasible that Russia will descend. Really? Russia will descend? China will march? And Tehran will march. Why? asks this writer. This is his concluding comment in this article. Why? To extract the sliver sized country, to unblock the flow of commerce, and to deal with the Jewish problem once and for all. Which is exactly what the scripture tells us that they're going to do. Try and deal with the Jewish problem once for all. Let's get rid of them. So, this, what we're seeing this year, is terribly important to you and me because it's telling us how close we are for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to move on from there and show you, I want to build on what we've just said and show you what's happening with these realignments. Now the ones I've just been talking about are not the important ones. They are just temporary ones. What I'm going to talk about now is the important ones that Ezekiel 38, particularly verse 13, is talking about. But let's lead into that by looking where Iran sits in the scheme of things. Iran, of course, is a problem not just for Israel, but for a lot of nations. And without reading this, this, this thing, you, you are aware, of course, that Iran is building military bases in Syria. Okay? And this is one of them. And Israel bombed this one on a couple of occasions because it, it, it looks pretty substantial. Uh, so this, is, this is a satellite pictures of it. So they've tried to, to bomb this thing. So where in the places that ISIS presence is decreasing, Iran is operating to fill the void, said this uh, Jewish writer. Okay, so Iran has become a problem in Syria. And they are identified by this Saudi writer as the real enemy, not Israel. He pointed out in, in the summary, well, there's no need for demonstrations of friendship toward Israel, a country that occupies Arab land. At the same time, he says, there's no need for unjustified demonization of Israel, especially at a time when the Palestinians themselves and Arab countries have already signed peace treaties with Israel. He goes on to say this, and you can see it there in the green. A careful examination of the question, who is the enemy, will, he says, lead to the clear conclusion that it is Iran and not Israel that poses a threat and endangers Saudi Arabia and that everything possible must be done to defeat it. So we've got a division now, haven't we? A very serious division in the Muslim world. Now as I said a little earlier, what does Ezekiel 38, 13 require? It requires that Sheba and Dedan be the first to object to the Gogian invasion of the land. Okay? That's what it requires. And we just want to talk briefly about who Sheba is. Modern Yemen is Sheba of old. So you've got various so-called authorities that will tell you that. Modern archaeological studies support the view that the biblical kingdom of Sheba was the ancient Semitic civilization of Sabah or Sheba in southern Arabia in Yemen. So when the queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she came from this area, the kingdom of Sheba. So it's down here on the bottom end of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Okay, so there's, there's Sheba. And Dedan, of course, is a reference to the rest of that peninsula, and particularly over here to uh, the Gulf States as well. So you've got Saudi Arabia and the Gulf States, and the Sheba of the Bible, or Yemen, 
Now, you'll be aware, of course, of things happening in Yemen. I'm not going to say much about Yemen. It's, it's suffering worse than any other nation on earth at the moment. Millions of people will die, uh, or are already dying. There's, there's plagues, there's, there's dysentery, there's no food. The Saudi Arabians have blocked all of the harbours because Iran was sending weapons in, you know, in UN supplies. They were sending weapons in to support the Houthi rebels. Uh, and so Saudi Arabia said, no. Nope. So they blocked the ports. Now people are starving in there, hundreds of thousands. Syria might be suffering, brethren and sisters, but Yemen is the country that's worst off in the world today. So what about this huge division between the Muslim uh, arms uh, of the world? Well, you'd be aware, of course, that there are two very distinct uh, parts of the Muslim religion. There's the Sunnis, who are the blue. So when you look at this map here, you can see the blue areas. They represent the, the Sunni Muslims in the world. And the green is the Shia. Now, the reason that they are so violently opposed uh, to each other is that they disagree uh, on who should be the, the leader, the prophet, and so on. And, and so the you know, the, the, the certain of them are waiting for the, the 12th Imam to arrive, you know, and they see this almost like the return of Christ and so on. So there's a deep division, religious division, and as, as you well know, when you get division in a religious community, it can be very violent. So this community is at war. Now, Iran is 100% Shia. Iraq is 60% Shia and 40% Sunni. ISIS, by the way, is Sunni, which is interesting. So this is why Iran is dead against ISIS, you see, even though they're Muslims. That's why Iran is in Syria, because ISIS is in Syria. That's why Iran is fiddling in, Ye in Yemen. You see, Yemen's got a sort of little bit of green shadow to it. Well, there's, there's an interest there because the Houthi rebels uh, being supported by Iran. And Saudi Arabia, next door, is trying to overthrow the Houthi rebels. You get a bit of a feel for what's happening in the world. Now, I think this is the quote of the year. Others may disagree. You probably will see why I say that when we proceed. This quote appeared in the article with a title, Proxy War Between Iran and Saudi Arabia Intensifies. So what has happened is that this division in the Muslim world between Sunni and Shia has produced champions. It's always the way, isn't it? Now the champions of the Sunni Muslims is Saudi Arabia. The champion of the Shia Muslims is Iran. That's why Saudi Arabia and Iran are at loggerheads right now. But there's something coming out of this which no one expected except Christadelphians. It goes on to say this, there are times, this is the quote I think that is really fabulous, there are times in history when the confluence of events conspire to install a position that was once regarded as a fantasy. So this division of the Sunni and Shiite Muslim nations is the source of these remarkable developments we want to talk about in the Middle East for the rest of this session. I'm going to start with this article in Debka File goes back to June this year, and the heading was Naming Bin Salman, Saudi Air Impacts US and Israel. So what happened in June? Well, something highly significant. In fact, they call it a game-changing event, and it's true. The Saudi king's decision to elevate his son, Prince Mohammed Bin Salman, who's only 31 years of age, to crown prince and heir to the throne in place of his cousin, Mohammed bin Nayef, as part of a broad reshuffle, is not merely, you see this, this highlighting here in blue, is not merely the internal affair of the royal hierarchy, but a game-changing international event. Now, this, this fellow, whoever wrote this particular article, uh, knew where it was going. He's very, very perceptive. They're going to talk about their analysis of the outcome being that of the uh, process initiated by Donald Trump and, of course, as I said, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, is deeply involved in this as a very close friend of Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi 
Arabia. Well, so we're seeing reasons for the election of Donald Trump. Let me just follow that up. This is Radio Free Europe, 26th of November, not that long ago. They were talking about Saudi Arabia launching its Islamic counter-terrorism summit. The Crown Prince, this is this Mohammed bin Salman, has opened the first high-level meeting of the kingdom-led alliance of Muslim nations against terrorism, pledging that, terror that extremists will no longer tarnish our beautiful religion. By extremists, he means Iran, principally, Shia, its surrogates Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and the Houthi in Yemen. Now, Iran, of course, uh, has a nemesis, and that nemesis is ISIS. So while Houthi and ISIS are related, Saudi Arabia sees them as a real problem, even though they might be Sunni-based. They're extremists. Sunni and Shiite branches, as we said, are clearly at war. And Fox News reported, 29th of November this year, up to this point, the Hamas charter calls for the decimation of Israel. But as Egyptian diplomats have pointed out, there's a willingness for Hamas and Fatah to recognise Israel as a Jewish state. Really? Am I reading that correctly? If you've ever been following what Hamas believes about Israel, you know that they're only satisfied if Israel doesn't exist. They want the utter destruction of Israel. They are not prepared to negotiate. Never have been. But they are now. And that happened in 2017. So why? Why is that happening? We're going to find out. So this is for the first time in their collective past, both Hamas, who are in Gaza Strip, and Fatah, that's the Palestinians in the West Bank, based in Ramallah, they're talking about recognising Israel as a Jewish state. Prime Minister Netanyahu, he, he sees where this is going. He can't miss this opportunity. He recognises the tectonic changes, notice the tectonic changes in the Sunni world. He's going to grab it. Well, he... This article appeared in the Jerusalem Post, 14th of November. Lebanese newspaper Al Akbar, sounds a bit like the, you know, what they cry out, you know. Exposed Tuesday morning the secret document of the Saudi Foreign Ministry that it claims includes this roadmap towards rejuvenating the 2002 Saudi Peace Initiative. Well, I'll tell you something. They weren't. That's been diced. I'll show you that in a minute. It's been diced. They're starting all over again. They're turning the page. They're not going to go back to their old way of dealing with Israel. It's totally new. He hints at meetings and understandings between Israeli and Saudi officials. Now Washington, of course, is in on the act and the foreign minister, this guy, confirms mutual visits. They're not trying to hide this. They're out in the open. So why does Saudi Arabia need Israel, do you think? Why do they need some kind of relationship with Israel? Well, this article tells you, Fox News. The third leg in this three-legged peace stall is a joint Saudi and Israeli effort to defeat Iran. Israel's very interested in that. And now, Saudi Arabia is just as interested in the defeat of Iran as Israel is. And to defeat Hezbollah, supported financially and with weapons by Iran in southern Lebanon. And develop a plan to interrupt an imperial desire for a Shia crescent. Yeah. That's Iran's objective, a Shia crescent. When an Iranian missile was fired into the Saudi capital, Riyadh, the Crown Prince realised that a direct confrontation with Iran is inevitable. It is going to happen. He knows that. He also assessed his ability to defeat Iran in a land battle and concluded his forces do not measure up. However, with Israeli assistance, a joint force might prevail. Ah, Hence, the Crown Prince is developing joint military manoeuvres with Israel as his key ally. Really? Isn't this the country that financed four wars against Israel? 48, 49, 56, 67, 73? Yeah. That's the fantasy. See? 
It's the fantasy. And the world's looking at that saying, uh, what's that about? And we say, fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Sheba and Dedan, first to object to the Gogi invasion. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but that really excites me. Because we've been waiting so long for this. I was baptised in 1967. Three or four months before the Six Day War. Imagine what my first year in the truth was like. And it's now 2017, almost gone. We have been waiting so long for these things to come to pass. And they have come to pass. They're coming to pass in 2017. Is the fantasy, this was the heading of this article, is the fantasy of a Middle East peace accord about to come true? For years it was believed a peace accord between Israel and Palestinians simply couldn't, couldn't happen. Right? It could be achieved, but it couldn't happen because the Palestinians wouldn't agree with anything. They wanted the total destruction of Israel, no discussion. Okay? So every attempt they thought they could achieve it was overthrown. Egyptian officials have united Fatah and Hamas entities for political purpose, thereby setting the stage for negotiation without internal discord between the Palestinians, which has been very common. Second, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has been the catalyst in bringing parties together. It would be an extraordinary feather in his cap, they say, if you pull this off. And you're doing a pretty good job. Because, you see, there are factors at work which have been brought about by the intervention of the angels, by the, uh, by the actions of Israel and other nations. And this is a report from the UN, I'm not going to read all of that, UN report in July this year that the Gaza Strip was unlivable. Ten years after Hamas seized power. You simply can't live there. Not comfortably anyway. Two million people live in the Gaza Strip. Declining incomes, unemployment is over 40%. They don't have any decent health care. The schools are a shambles, so you can't educate your children. If they are lucky, they have three hours a day of electricity. Right? So all of this is causing huge problems, and if that wasn't bad enough, you can't get fresh water in the, in the garden street. So it's unbelievable. I mean, that's not my... That's, that's the UN, right? They've declared it unbelievable. So Hamas is in serious trouble, and they know it. You recall that the Gulf, state, the, the, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia actually cut off Qatar, okay, the little country of Qatar, during 2017. Remember that? Why did they do that? Well, because Qatar continued to send funds to Hamas. And Saudi Arabia, the Gulf state, says, no more. No more funds to Hamas. Okay? We're not supporting them anymore. Qatar said, well, we are going to support them. So Saudi Arabia says, well, sorry, but you're no longer in our club. You can get out. So that's what happened this year. So the financial starvation of the Palestinian Authority, that's what PA means. This article said Trump administration to snap ties. This is pretty recent. This is December 23rd, right? to snap ties with the Palestinians, no peace plan, no more monetary aid. That's a big change, isn't it? Obama, he must be having, uh, he must be uh, going to the drink, I think. You know? <laughs> he can't believe what's happening, can he? Post his presidency. The White House has decided to quietly withdraw from all its ties with the Ramallah-based Palestinian Authority. And Mahmoud Abbas, he's the leader of the Palestinians in the West Bank. They made several warnings of what was in store if he did not desist from castigating the US President's uh, uh, declaration of Jerusalem uh, as the capital of Israel. Last week, notice this, this is very important, last week, two Arab crown princes, this is our guy, the 31-year-old Saudi Mohammed bin Salman, and the UAE, that's the Gulf States, Sheikh Zayed, 
summoned Abbas to their capitals and urged him strongly to back away from his attacks on President Trump. He got the same advice from the ruler of Qatar. Guess what? Qatar has realised they've got to get back in the club. They can't afford to be outside this group of Gulf states, see? So this sheik got in the act, conferred with Washington on the subject, all to no avail. Abbas stayed the course. America said, no more money, no peace agreements. We're out. That is a remarkable development. And it's shaping these new alliances in the East. In 1985, Hezbollah officially announced its establishment by publishing an open letter that identified the US, and this is very important too, the US and the Soviet Union as Islam's principal enemies and called for the obliteration of Israel, which is said was occupying Muslim lands. And you will see the Hezbollah troops in southern Lebanon are actually marching, trampling on what appears to be a, an Israeli flag painted on the pavement. That's their attitude towards Israel. It's trampling on the Israeli flag. You know, even this is about to change because the Hezbollah are supported by Iran. Saudi Arabia is joining with Israel and with Egypt against Iran and this is going to be one of the casualties. Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Israel has to remove them. They can't have the peace of which Ezekiel 38 speaks unless Hezbollah is gone. They've got 26,000 rockets, all of which can reach the Sinai Peninsula. So no city, no town in Israel is safe from the Iraq. And Israel knows there'll be war shortly with them. And they'll get the green light. I wonder who they get the green light from. Well, no problem from the UN, say. No problem from Saudi Arabia or Egypt. And no problem from Russia. Okay. So that's where that's going to go. We'll see. We'll have to wait on that. But Lebanon, the country in which they've planted themselves, is in strife. It's in chaos. This year, the ruling party led by Sunni PM, uh, this is Sunni PM, Sayyad Hariri, agreed to a coalition with Hezbollah, the party of God, the Shia based supported party. That ah, can't work, is it? Not in this environment. Hezbollah, Shia, is a proxy of Iran. Saudi Arabia, Sunni, forced Harari to resign early in November this year. So they flew him down to Saudi Arabia and says, you've got to leave office. He did, for a month. On the 6th of December, 2017, he withdrew his resignation saying that all parties had agreed to dissociate themselves from conflicts in Arab countries. Nonsense, of course, is my word. <laughs> that wasn't in the article. But it is nonsense, isn't it? A war between Israel and Saudi Arabia and it's back and Hezbollah is imminent. And Israel knows that. They don't want it because they know it's going to cause a lot of heartache, particularly in the north. Um, you know, Kiryat Shimona, you've got to go through that to go to Dan and, and uh, you know, those places that we like to visit up there in the north of the land. So it's going to be, it's going to be hard, but it'll happen because it will bring out the peace that we must have. So I'm going to turn now to where Israel sits in all of this, in what little time we have left. Some of you will have heard Benjamin Netanyahu's speech at the UN this year. If you didn't, you can actually get the full transcript. You just type it in, Netanyahu's speech at the UN, September 2017. Quite different to the one he gave in September 2016. In that one in September 2016, he, he boasted about Israel being the only genuinely democratic country in the Middle East, he talked about all the advances that Israel had come up with and he boasted about Tel Aviv becoming the capital of homosexuality in Europe. Uh, that was the speech in 2016. Disgusting. This year was different. Mr President, he said, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of a great revolution. A revolution in Israel standing among the nations. This is happening because so many countries around the world have finally woken up to what Israel can do for them. Those countries now recognise what brilliant investors like Warren Buffett and great companies like Google and Intel, what they've recognised and known for years. 
This, by the way, is his emphasis. This, is, this comes out of the, the transcript. Okay? That Israel is the innovation nation. The place for cutting edge technology and agriculture. In water, in cyber security, in medicine, in autonomous vehicles, you name it. He said, we've got it. He's quite right. So they have. Exactly as you would expect when you read Ezekiel 38 verse 12. Okay? It's exactly what you would expect. What about Israel and India? Well, in his speech Netanyahu said in July Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel because, because India under Indira, Indira Gandhi was pro-Russian. Most of India's Navy for 30 years was acquired by buying Russian ships. Okay, not anymore. You may have seen the pictures, he said. We were on a beach in Hadera. We rode together in a jeep outfitted with a portable desalination device that some thriving Israeli entrepreneur invented. We took off our shoes, we landed in the Mediterranean and drank seawater that had been purified only a few minutes earlier on the back of the jeep. We imagined, he said, the endless possibilities for India, for Israel and for all humanity. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? Why? Why is this happening? Well, because you see, there is a, a, an eastern Tarshish, isn't there? When Solomon sent his ships from Elat, they went across to India and they brought back apes and all sorts of stuff from the eastern Tarshish. Yeah, and there will be an eastern Tarshish at the end of the days. India just happens to have the largest navy in the Indian Ocean. Right. Strong naval power. Not widely known. Once very pro Russian, now very pro West and pro Israel. Very close ties with Israel because both of them are at the head of technology in the world. So he comes along, does Modi. He stands out for Israel, said this article, Debka, and first Prime Minister to visit. Israel attracts far more venture capital per person than any other country, $170 in 2010 to America's 75 And God, there's the list. He knows where the, what side he's bread buttered on, doesn't he? So he's making moves. At the same time that Pakistan is heading towards Russia. Because the US has said to Pakistan, you're evidently supporting the Taliban who are killing our troops and others in, 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 in Afghanistan. We'll pull them back from you. are not going to give Putin the mentally stepped in and said, we'll sell you weapons. Did you see, eventually, as we'll see in our next session, God willing, that's where he's going to end up. His boundary as the King of the North will be the Indus River, the ancient boundary of the Medo-Persian and Greek empires, required by three passages in Scripture. We'll deal with it later on. Strong mutual interests between Israel and India. His predecessors kept at arm's length, but now Modi is lifting the curtain on a thriving military relationship. He's there for three days to advance sales and production of missiles, drones, etc. Now I'm going to finish this session with some, what I think is some notable quotations and the very latest update on the stuff that I've seen that's happening in, in uh, the Middle East. This fellow, Hakim, head of the Middle East Centre for Strategic and Legal Studies in Jeddah, so Saudi Arabia, writes this way. He says, Israel and Saudi Arabia face a common Nazi-like threat, it's interesting name, Nazi-like threat in Iran. He said, the Arab mind must liberate itself from the legacy of former Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser and the legacy of both the Sunni and Shia sects, which has instilled for political interests the culture of Jew hatred and denial of the historic right in the region. This guy is a Saudi academic, all right? And he's now writing things like that. That's, that's unbelievable. Except the Bible students. US, new US military moves in the Middle East. Debka file, December the, the 3rd this year. The United States, after being frozen in place for much of the Middle East, suddenly sprang into action in the past 48 hours along with its senior Middle East allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia. There they are together. On four fronts. Iraq, Syria, Yemen and the Palestinians. In Syria... Early Saturday, December 2nd, Israeli warplanes dropped missiles. So they talk about how that actually worked itself out. Okay? 
So they, Israel went and bombed that free institution of Iran. US acts through allies. Yemen. This guy, Ali Abdullah Saleh, former president of Yemen, the mainstay of the Iranian-backed Houthi insurgency, announced he was turning the page. He was ready to ditch the Houthis and their backer, Iran. Provided that the coalition, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, lifted the blockade that's causing so much heartache in Yemen. Israel and Palestinians, Trump administration, fed up with the dodgy Palestinian tax on peace negotiations. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and Saudi, here he is again, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman are likewise ready to wash their hands of the Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas. I mean, look, if you went back 12 months and you read that, you'd think that is fake news to use a Donald Trump phrase. It's fake news. But it's not fake news, is it? It's fulfilling Bible promise. That's what it is. So here's your latest headlines. The score's been around for a while, a couple of weeks. US President Donald Trump recognised Jerusalem as Israel's capital, announces embassy to re relocate to Jerusalem. Saudi academic calls on Arabs to recognise Jewish connection to Jerusalem. These are headlines. That's the Jerusalem Post. Arab states worry over India's lacklustre response to Trump's Jerusalem move. Kuwaiti newspaper, Israeli attacked Iranian military factories in Syria. Iran's support for Palestinian militants fighting Trump move on Jerusalem. That's not surprising. Putin to visit Turkey and Egypt amid anger over Trump's Jerusalem move. Islamic summit on Jerusalem showcases new Middle East alliances. Now this is interesting. This is 14th of December. This is not written in the North American way, by the way. 14th of December, 2017. The leaders of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates did not attend the emergency meeting about Trump's announcement, sending a message that they would not be standing shoulder to shoulder with Iran. Very interesting, isn't it? Brothers and sisters and young people, what the world is called the fantasy is becoming a reality because of Bible prophecy.